My colleagues and I at Culture on the Edge were recently discussing Manuel de Landa's A New Philosophy of Society, Assemblage Theory and Social Complexity. And uh, a quotation came up in that reading that really spoke to a lot of points that I found myself making in recent years uh, relating to Brexit, Trump, um, millennials, sense of, sense of entitlement, and all that sort of thing. Um, so I thought, rather than write a blog post about it, I could record a blog post about it and maybe also then go into things in a little bit more detail. So first of all, before I read this quotation to you, I'll need to explain a couple of things. Delanda's notions of assemblages and territorialization or deterritorialization. Sounds complex, but basically an assemblage is a collection of things. And his argument throughout the book is that um, any individual, whether that's an individual, atom, person, desk, society, nation, universe, um, is, is an assemblage, can be conceptualized as an assemblage of various parts. So the idea is that there is no um, essence, there is no whole, every whole is composed of parts. That's an assemblage. That's all you really need to know for that. It goes into a lot more detail, of course. Um, territorialization and deterritorialization. That's basically um, so things that bind things together or cause things to become more loose. So a territorializing force, um, for example, in the, an example that he uses is when we're talking about um, you know rituals and habits. So they are territorializing things or a sense of identity. We perform them again and again, and it sort of makes our identity um, stronger. It makes us feel more um, coherent, and it provides boundaries. Deterritorializing in the same um, sense, um, you know, when we're intoxicated or actually when we gain new skills or meet new people, those um, mess with our, our conceptualization of who we were beforehand. So this doesn't have to be individuals, doesn't have to be to do with identity. Basically, um, anything that introduces heterogeneity and, and changes the scope of the playing field, changes the territory, that's deterritorializing. So the quotation, I'll read it and then I'll go into what I think it means. So he says, the reality or threat of armed conflict is itself a powerful territorializing force, making people rally behind their governments and close ranks with each other. Much as the solidarity binding a community may be transformed into social exclusion when conflict with other communities sharpens their sense of us versus them. External war can transform a simple emotional attachment to a country's traditions and institutions into a sense of superiority relative to enemy countries and their allies. Loyalty, which need not involve comparisons with others, is transformed into hostility and xenophobia. Internal war, on the other hand, can act as a deterritorializing force, either by destabilizing a government through constant riots and turmoil, or by drastically changing its very identity from one regime to another, as in successful political revolutions. Unlike coup d'etat, revolutions go beyond interactions between government organizations. The minimum assemblage, a recurrent one in past revolutions, includes a population that has undergone a period of relative prosperity and rising expectations, followed by a period of deprivation when those expectations are frustrated, a struggle between dominant coalitions and those who challenge them, and displays of vulnerability by government organisations, such as a decrease in their enforcement capacities due to a fiscal crisis, a bad economy, or a military defeat abroad. So let's translate that for you, um, at least how I see it. So um, basically armed conflict or the threat of it is a thing that binds people together. Um, you know, we, we are out there fighting, everyone within the country suddenly starts to feel much more identified with each other. You'll start to find less dissent and people identify much more as us versus them. As I say, it can trans it can even transform simple emotional attachment to country's traditions into um, a sense of superiority regarding enemy countries and their allies. So declaring war 
or threats of war, rumours of war can act or seem to be able to uh, increase people's um, us versus them mentality, increase their feelings of solidarity with people like them and increase their loyalty to the state. Then deterritorializing force, well, it's an internal war, but here's the interesting thing. Um, a population that has undergone a period of relative prosperity and rising expectations, followed by a period of deprivation when those expectations are frustrated. And then also a fiscal crisis, a bad economy, or a military defeat abroad. Now, what does that sound like? undergoing a period of relative prosperity and rising expectations, followed by a period of deprivation when those expectations are frustrated. That, to me, in a nutshell, uh, this de-territorializing force it explains Brexit and Trump. I mean, I'm, I'm not reducing it to these, um, these factors, but I think it's certainly played an enormous role. Um, we, quote, in the West, have never had it so good. Um, almost since the Second World War, things have still been getting better, better, and better. Um, and this is fundamentally unsustainable. Um, we can't keep improving um, our quality of life. We can't keep um, improving um, productivity. We can't keep increasing GDP, that the world is a closed system, all of this stuff comes from there. Um, we've been benefiting from this post-war boom and, and what I would call the continued colonialization, uh, the colonialism of, of capitalism. Um, you know, we may not be in the UK context literally an empire anymore, but we're still exploiting people all across the world. And you can only exploit others so much when the system begins to shudder. Um, when suddenly it seems like, oh, maybe I can't have the latest Apple iPhone, or maybe I, you know, I'm going to have to work a little bit harder. Um, suddenly, um, we're not so nice anymore. Suddenly, we end up voting for reactionary politics. We end up voting in that guy with the awful wig that's currently in the White House. We end up ejecting um, the United Kingdom from the European Union, which, as I argued in my last video, is probably was probably one of the few things that was keeping the UK from backsliding into the xenophobic place it's finding itself in just now. So where are we just now? A bunch of people, you know, everyone's always going, oh, look at those millennials, how entitled they are. Yeah, you know, we've never had it so good, right? And that's being challenged. And what's happening now? The ire is being turned on the immigrants, the EU, We've got war brewing in North Korea, Russia, Iran, you know, threats of war. And what we see here is we've had the deterritorializing of the fiscal crisis. We've seen the deterritorializing of the relative prosperity and rising expectations followed by a period of deprivation. And in the face of that, in the face of uh, our, our shifting and disintegrating loyalties to the various Western nation states, what happens? The territorialization comes into effect. The ire is turned. It's turned on the immigrants. It's turned on the EU. It's turned on North Korea, on Russia, so that hopefully the governments can claim back some of our loyalty. If only we can make them point at an external other, then we can reassert their identity with our nation state and we can re assert our control and power over them. Ultimately, here we have Delanda saying something that Charles suddenly have said in the pub quite a few times in recent years. We've never had it so good. You can only exploit people so much and we're going to have to take a hit on our living standards um, in the West. I'm certainly willing to, and I'm willing to so that we can help all those immigrants, so that we can help all those refugees uh, so that we can help everyone who's further down the food chain than we are, whether or not we know them, whether or not we like them. Okay, that's me out. Hope you like this, and I'll try and do some more of these videos in the coming weeks instead of just writing. But even if I could be doing just some writing, that'd be a pretty brilliant thing. Cheers.